Hi, and welcome to A Sense of Wellness podcast, inspiring and empowering a healthier you. I'm your host, Susan Greeley, and I'll be diving deeper into the four pillars of wellness, sleep, exercise, nutrition, and stress management. Today's episode brings me to a very happy place talking about food. I will be discussing a relatively new practice area of health that combines cooking and the medical field. I'm excited to share information about culinary medicine and other facets of food, nutrition, and lifestyle medicine. My guest today is cardiologist and chef, Dr. Michael Fenster, better known as Chef Dr. Mike. I'm happy to welcome him to my podcast today as he is described as the world's first triple threat as an interventional cardiologist, a professional chef, and a professor of culinary medicine. He has published four books on food, diet, and health, including The Food Shaman and Ancient Eats, and he has two more books in the works. He teaches one of the only university courses in culinary medicine at the University of Montana, where he holds joint faculty appointments in the College of Health and the Culinary Arts Program. All that said, you can tell I'm very excited to talk with Chef Dr. Mike today. Thank you for joining me and taking time to talk about your culinary medicine passion. Oh, thanks so much, Susan. I am so excited to be here with you today. And I think we're actually going to cover, you know, two things because we're going to be talking about food, which obviously has something to do with nutrition, uh, particularly from a culinary medicine perspective. But boy, doesn't isn't a great meal a stress a reducer? I mean, you sit down with friends, family, and the stress level drops, have a glass of wine. You know, that's also a big part of culinary medicine. So I think today we're going to cover a couple of those pillars for you. We're definitely covering multiple pillars. That's what I'm very excited about. And yes, we all, we love to eat. Humans love to eat. We're social creatures. I completely agree with you. There's nothing better than sharing a delicious, I'm going to say home cooked meal with friends. And yeah, oh. so we'll start there. Um, you have a quote on your website. Good food can fix just about everything. It's not complicated. And to tell you, I love that quote. And oh, thank you. yeah, I completely swear by it as well. So we're here today to inspire and empower people. And I want to start by you sharing your personal story. I think it's very, I was going to say cool. It is because yeah. listeners don't know, we were chatting how you actually started in the world of food and becoming a chef before you actually became a cardiologist, not the reverse. So yeah, tell right. us your story and we'll start there. Well, it actually goes... Oh, I'd love to. Um, it actually goes back a little bit before actually where you and I were talking about. I grew up in the deep, dark, ancient days before the Internet. And we have really moved around a lot in different places as we were talking from New York City and New Jersey, uh, upstate New York for a little bit as well. And that kind of always made me the new kid on the block, but not like in the boy band, really popular way, uh, in the sort of social pariah way as the new kid. And and my mom was a great home cook and was really into Julia Child and Graham Care, the Galloping Gourmet and cookbooks. And so I had come home from school and, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends, but the kitchen was always a place I could go because she was there and we cooked together. So for me, very on, and you already mentioned it, you know, the, the social aspect, the sort of social currency, healing aspects of food way beyond just the nutrients in terms of the food experience. That had a big, big impact on me, you know, growing up. And so it was real natural when I went to college that when I had to work to help pay for college, the first place I'd go would be, you know, the professional food industry. And since I cook with my mom, you know, I was like, hey, I'm pretty darn good. Uh, hey, guys, you're lucky I'm going to cook for you in your restaurant today. And I spent six months then washing dishes because that was the only thing that was open <laughs> and eventually got an opportunity to short order cook on the line and went to another restaurant that was opening and had somebody take me under their wing. Fantastic cook, really taught me all my professional cooking skills. He never went to culinary school. He grew up in the industry. Uh, Joe was an amazing guy, you know, taught me to tell the, the doneness of a steak by where you push on your face, you know, rare, uh, medium rare, medium well done by hitting different areas of your face and comparing that to, to the rebound of the steak. And eventually when I left college, uh, I was running the back of the house. I'd be what we call an executive chef today on a Saturday or Friday, depending on the week. I ran the whole shebang opening to closing. And, and it was really, really, you know, a formative and great experience. And then from there, I went off to medical school 
became an interventional cardiologist, did some work as a NIH-sponsored research person uh, at the University of Virginia doing microvascular physiology, which would come to serve me many years later very well in culinary medicine with understanding a lot of the vascular biology uh, that goes on at a very intense level, shall we say. Uh, so that was a great experience. And uh, eventually, you know, my love of food and health came together when I had my own personal health challenges. So, you know, I was very busy, obviously, as you can imagine, as an intern, a resident, a cardiology fellow, and then very busy clinician in the, in the cardiac catheterization laboratory doing lots and lots of procedures and really got away from what I knew good food was. And, you know, stuff shows up in the hospital. It's free. You're running from here to there. You grab, you know, this sandwich that came out of this drive through or uh, I was in Winston-Salem for a bit. So the home of Krispy Kreme donuts. Yeah. You know, and, and there was nothing better. You know, you finished the ER shift and you were back on to round at 6 a.m. and you could hit that red light, get those melt in your mouth Krispy Kremes, a jumbo coffee, you know, and be back and ready to go on that sugar high. And I was confronted with, as I said, some personal health challenges and told I needed surgery, actually two surgeries like yesterday for joint replacements. And I was like, boy, let me think about that. So I got a second opinion, second first, same as the first. And then I was like, well, what can I do? And I did end up getting a just a joint debridement because the joints were so bad. Uh, but I opted for deferring the joint replacement because that's that's always an option down the road. And I tell you now, that's well over 20 years ago. And, and I don't do high impact things like play basketball like I used to or do running, you know, on the hard pavement. Um, but I hike, you know, for eight or 10 hours in the summer in the mountains of Montana all day. And, you know, I, I bike 100 miles a week uh, in our biking season. And, and I still haven't had those joint replacements they told me I had to have. And that, that oh goes back to, you know, uh, uh, just changing how, we, how I ate. That is true lifestyle medicine. So we're going to, that's a great segue to that. And yes, clearly we're, we will be talking about all of my pillars. Well, we'll bring sleep in somehow, but you've already mentioned, you know, we're talking nutrition, we're talking exercise, we're talking stress. Talk about, and so this is what I want listeners to know. I mean, the intensity of a job as a clinician, pretty much of any kind, specifically cardiology, that stress level and intensity is very, you know, hard to actually describe. But then the transition to what I will call more, you know, life is meant to be fun. And you said to yourself, I want to have fun. I want to be active. I want to be healthy. So how did you then decide to pursue culinary medicine or culinary uh, nutrition, I call it? And uh, what is culinary medicine, actually? Well, so um, I'll give you the, the definition, you know, as, as we use it at the University of Montana, as I use it in what I teach. And that specifically is the multidisciplinary application of evidence-based decision-making and a selection of ingredients and techniques used in preparing foodstuffs with the goal of achieving and maintaining health and wellness through an optimized food experience. And, and that's kind of a, a lot there to, to uh, <laughs> unpack. But, but, but there's a couple of key points, um, I think, that differentiate culinary medicine from things like nutrition, per se, and, and, and some other pursuits and even other sort of versions of culinary medicine, if you will. One is that we're multidisciplinary. So, yes, we certainly have learned a lot from nutrition over the hundred plus years that that's really existed as a science. We continue uh, to learn and incorporate that data set. But as you said earlier, right, we are social primates. I like to say, and this goes back to a great book by Richard Rangham, a Harvard anthropologist called Catching Fire where he really talks about how we evolved as human beings. And he makes a great case that it all started when, you know, your ancestor, my ancestors were sitting around the Serengeti in Africa somewhere. And one night, one of us decided like, hey, you know, Susan's uh, forebear, how about, you know, we share some mastodon ribs over the grill. And, you know, we started telling stories and singing and dancing. And somebody was a chef and started cooking for the rest of us. And the human species was was born. And, you know, that um, that aspect of what we share that encompasses 
what I mentioned at the end of that definition, a food experience turns out to impact our health in many, many different ways. So certainly it starts with what we eat. You know, that's sort of the obvious thing. That's what's on the plate. But in, in culinary medicine, we're looking at things like regenerative agriculture. So what is it we're eating? How's it come? It has to be sustainable for us. I have to love what I'm eating. I, I'm excited to cook every day. I get in there and I enjoy that meal. That's important. If as a cardiologist, I t all I do is tell people what they can eat and deprive them and they go into a deep, dark depression like I would if people told me I, all the things I couldn't eat. Depression is as potent a risk factor for a heart attack and and for more serious complications than any cholesterol level. Yet, you know, as a cardiologist, I never was taught to sit down and tell somebody, hey, you know, here's 40 units of happiness, you know, learn to smile. That's good for you. But it turns out it is. It's very hard to quantitate. We can't write a prescription for it where I can give you a drug, follow your cholesterol level. That's easy. That's neat. That's in a box that's quantifiable. But just because we can't do that doesn't mean that those variables don't have impact. And as I said, there's a lot of those variables out there that do. So things like how we eat, when we eat, with whom we eat, et cetera, where we eat, when we eat all impact us. Many other countries have done a great job of studying this. Like if we look at, at Japan, um, where I spent some time, for many years, the is part of their national health program. They've encouraged people to eat amongst nature, something we call in the West forest bathing. And what they found is I can give you the same meal. And if you're eating it in your cubicle, you know, stuffing something in your gob, thinking about your next meeting, answering the, the phone, texting messages, mm -hmm. Uh, versus going into the park, taking the same amount of time, surrounding yourself with nature and, you know, having a glass of chill uh, along with your meal. Wow. When we look at things like blood pressure, inflammatory markers, uh, et cetera, uh, what we find is that those have important, powerful impacts on our health. So all of those types of things are incorporated in what we study in culinary medicine. Any other important thing? Is that, is that we look at the evidence um, and go where that takes us, not where we want to go or think we should go. And so in my career, a developing culinary medicine, I've been doing this over a decade now, there have been some big potholes um, and pot shots, you know, at, at me as I've gone along the road, because um, sometimes this, this requires a bit of hoisting the black flag and, and firing, you know, a shot across the bow and being willing to take a pirate stand. So, yeah, uh, that's... Uh, that, that goes part and parcel, I think, if you're going to pursue these types of new innovations in, in healthcare and, and certainly food in healthcare. Right. And it doesn't sound like food is an innovation by any means, yet it really is. Culinary nutrition, I keep saying that because nutrition is my background, culinary medicine, I should say, lifestyle medicine. We are still learning so much and the application of it is, you know, why we're here and talking about this because people are very overwhelmed and confused and also in a rush all the time. And don't you see that all the time? So I love what you just mentioned about the experience and in that whole long definition, who's going to remember anything but the last two words, which were <laughs> the food experience. No, I really mean that to slow down, chew your food, taste your food and experience it. And I think aside from what they're actually eating, if you focus on the whole atmosphere that, you know, these other aspects to Every time you eat during the day, that is something very controllable for people to decrease their stress levels, probably weight management, you know, and I, I do want to talk about that because it's like this big mystery, like how do I lose weight? And people get more and more intense and they're eating faster and they're moving faster and they're not losing weight and they don't understand why and they're sleeping terribly. And so I, I tie it all together. This is fascinating though. I think this is just opening people's eyes and perspective on food. And how we eat is just as important as what we eat is, you know, so that's my long spiel. There's a question in here coming for you. <laughs> Chef Dr. Mike. I, I guess, you know, what are some of the key food, you know, when, if you have an outline of the whole curriculum for culinary medicine, what, where do you start? Well, um, we start where actually you, you led us, which was what is culinary medicine. And so we talked about that. And I think in terms of practical application, um, I, I want to go back to a point that you made because it's, it's really so critical, Susan. And you talked about people saying, well, you know, how do I lose weight? What's going on? 
And, and it's really one of the entry points um, when we go to apply culinary medicine. So if somebody came to me, uh, comes to our team, uh, because we have sort of a team approach in culinary medicine, and you know, said, okay, well, you know, where does it start? What's the very first thing I can do? Uh, we're going to look at their diet. And, you know, this is shocking, but true. It was published either August, September of 2021 by uh, Dr. Mazafarian out of Tufts University. And, and he showed that from age five onwards, five, 70% of the average American's diet is ultra processed foods. And that leads into what you talked about losing weight with a hallmark study that was done um, by Harvard nutritionist, uh, Hall, Dr. Hall, Kevin Hall and, and Dr. Tobias. And what they did, it was a great study. And I, and I, I, I hate kind of getting into the weeds, but sometimes it makes a great example. Um, so I'll just summarize it real briefly because it really is was a landmark study um, and really shifted a whole perspective for a lot of people and really backed up what I've been saying for many years. So I, obviously I, I want to raise that flag. But they had they had patients stuck in a hospital where you don't get to choose what you want to eat. And so every patient served as their own control. So it was that person's own body was responding to the to the diet. And they had two diets. One was minimally processed foods, uh, and we can get to this, but something we would call ANOVA classification one to three in our culinary medicine world, uh, or ultra processed food, something we would call ANOVA group four food in our culinary medicine world. And then they did something really smart because they're from Harvard, right? And that's what Harvard people do. They're really smart. And they, they matched it not only for calories, so the caloric intake was exactly the same, but they matched it for macronutrient composition. So each diet had exactly the same amount of saturated fat, same amount of protein, same amount of you know carbs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was perfectly matched. And then they let people eat. And I said, here's your meal, you know, have at it. And the long and short of what they found was when people ate the diet that was ultra processed, they gained weight. When people ate the diet that was same diet, same calories, same macronutrient composition, but minimally processed food, or as we like to say, the real stuff uh, that we could like to cook with in the kitchen, um, they spontaneously lost weight. No difference in exercise, no difference, you know, control. Everybody was their own control. So strictly eating that ultra processed food, which has a, a very distinct definition, is one of the things that correlates to increased risk of obesity, diabetes, et cetera. And this has been shown in many other studies in a correlation type fashion for it really has come out really just the last couple of years, but it particularly seen in European data, in uh, South American data in Brazil, because the NOVA score that I alluded to was developed by Professor Montiero at the University of Sao Paulo. But it really correlates, as we've noticed after World War II, as we eat more and more ultra processed food, what do we see? We see this epidemic of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, all these complications. And not one country, not one of the 195 countries on the face of the globe that has seen that rise in obesity and type two diabetes has been able to reverse it yet. So it's a serious, serious problem. You know, personally, it's why I saw someone, and, and one of the things that pushed me into culinary medicine was, you know, the morning after seeing what a hospital served a young lady I had to do a emergency in coronary intervention on because she was having a heart attack. She was 24. What? Yes. I do have to ask you a little bit more about her. And <laughs> was she obese? Was it was it truly so, lifestyle from a young age? Yeah, so it was it, it was it's a it's a great story. Um so I was on call and it and it you know, people think, oh, well, maybe that happened, you know, in the Rust Belt in the South and, you know, they're serving, you know, they're eating grits and deep fried chicken. Now, I was in the Pacific Northwest in a pretty prestigious area as a foodie, as a chef, where like I know they the hip food and, you know, the, the greatest things and fresh from the ocean. And I, I was at this hospital that had a great reputation, great hospital. And it was 2 a.m. because you always get called at 2 a.m. when you're on interventional cardiology call. And the ER doc, whenever the ER doc calls you and they start to hem and haw a little bit, you know, there's more to the story. There's something they're not telling you. So he's like, hey, Mike. I was like, yeah, and like more like, yeah, uh, what? OK, as I'm waking up and and he he's like, well, listen, I got um, a gal down here. She's got classic chest pain. ECG's not, you know, definitive for an MI, but her story's great. 
And so I was wondering if I could just get you to, you know, come look at the ECG and, and tell me what you think. And I was like, yeah, okay, you know, let me look at it. So, you know, I pull up the, the ECG, I look at it, I call him back. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it's not really diagnostic. I mean, there's some things that are suggestive there. And I was like, let him fill in the blanks. Cause like, there's more here, something you're not telling me. And he's like, yeah, she's 24. And I was like, listen, um, statistically, this is probably nothing, but what you're telling me is classic for a heart attack. These changes are consistent, you know, with an early heart attack. I was like, let's just take her to the cath lab. And then, you know, we can all sleep good when everything's normal. Cause it's a very low risk procedure and a, you know, healthy, otherwise healthy 24 year old. And the next morning, you know, as I'm going in her room, because we put the stent in, I'm there for lunch to be delivered to her. And we're sitting there chatting, no family history, doesn't do drugs, doesn't smoke, but is morbidly obese with type two diabetes. And, you know, she's at 24 and, I, you know, and, and I'm talking to her about food choices and she's breaking down and crying. I mean, she's a lovely girl. And she's like, listen, and I think that a lot of people can relate to this. Um, you know, I spend my life in the literature and it's confusing for me. And she's like, I just didn't know what to eat because it's like they tell you one thing one day and they tell you not to eat it the next day. And then what they told you not to eat, you could eat. She said, so I just did what was easy and cheap. And that was go through the drive throughs and get like microwave meals and snacks to have at home and have things delivered. And we started to talk about that because that's an all ultra processed diet. And in walks what the hospital has sent her for lunch. And it is processed, del, ultra processed deli meat, turkey meat, or what's left of it, on white bread with a slice of American cheese that most people should know does not actually qualify by the definition of cheese, which was why you'll see cheese like processed food thing on the label. A packet of squeegee condiments, you know, that are covered. Well, uh, with their ingredients, because there's like 42, I, linked, I need to pull out my chemistry degree to decipher what's on the back of those. A salad in which I don't think one vegetable had seen a ray of sunshine, because you could have gone outside and played ping pong with the little cherry tomatoes. Omega-6 ultra-processed salad dressing and another squeegee. And and not a word of a lie, Susan, that god-awful green jello that everybody, it was actually on her plate. <laughs> <laughs> If listeners could see my face right now, because I think everybody knows I am a dietitian, and this is bringing back, so I'm, I'm suffering PTSD, where that, not only that, the patient thinks that I actually cooked that or it, recommended it in any way, shape or form as the dietitian. No. Oh, so see these experiences, you and I have lived kind of parallel lives. <laughs> um, yeah. And it does pushes you to this place where you say there is a better, healthier way we can prevent that, or we could help her reverse this, especially at such a young age. And I still tell people at really any age. And I hope that, you know, anybody listening, if it's not for themselves, it's for others through lifestyle medicine, through culinary medicine, you can begin, you can start, you can make positive changes on your health at any age, honestly. Right. Um, yeah, and, and I want to I want to um, second what you just said because you know a lot of my patients are older. Um, they, they've had heart attacks, and now they're con- you know they've confronted their own mortality. And okay, I, you know I'm being forced to make some changes. What can I do? And so it is never too late. Um, you know, one of the things in my field of interventional cardiology that you learn at an early age because it's at the forefront of what I do is life and death. And, and many, you know, in our society, we tend to kind of push that away until we're forced to confront it. And, but we're all going to uh, cross that finish line at some point or another in our life. And, and I think the difference is, how do you want to cross, right? Do you want to just walk across under your own pace with a big smile on your face? Or are you going to be the three-day-old roadkill that we have to drag across the finish line? Um, you know, and, and that, that's how it ends. So, you know, at any age, take control. If nothing else, you know, I've had so many patients who, who are, you know, retirees, 60, 70, even 80 years old, change and follow a culinary medicine way. And, it, and, and actually, they tell me that, that they feel better. They have more joy. They, they're enjoying their food because it's all about the pleasure, right? It's, that's the culinary and culinary medicine. You're, you cook, you're a chef, you know, yeah. right? It's all about that pleasure. 
in culinary medicine, we want the same pleasure that we give, that I give, and I'm about as a, a culinary professional. The difference is it's not about just the moment in my restaurant and bringing you back from a business perspective. Culinary medicine, I'm looking towards your health and wellness for the rest of your life. And that balances the equation a little bit. But what's fascinating in the study of things and what the data suggests, it's it's a it's it's not a drastic like people think, like I can't have anything good to it has to be plant based. I can't eat this, I can't eat that. And 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 there's too much of eat this, don't eat that, and not enough. And in culinary medicine, I would say one of the other foundational differences is something as simple as a change in perspective, a change in the question we ask as healthcare providers and advisors. And so as a cardiologist, if you come to my office, Susan, and I say, and we do a stress test, I say, well, listen, the stress test showed this, and now we're going to schedule a cardiac catheterization, and I want you to take an aspirin, and I'm going to put you on the statin medication and blah, blah, blah. And you say, thank you, doctor, very much. And, and you go out and you do. And and sort of we're, we do as we're told for, for a number of reasons. And unfortunately, I think in my experience, that's how we have dictated to people dietary advice. And, and it's do this, eat this, don't eat that with no regard for, you know, personal preferences, with sensitivity to the cultural background from which they come, the foods they grew up on, the foods they love, individual flavor profiles. And, and we took something that, as we said at the beginning, right, it was the joy, it's social currency, it's the joy of humanity is food and the food, shared food experience. And we made it work. And frankly, who the hell wants to work at food for the rest of your life? Not me. That's miserable. And so in, in culinary medicine, because of the evidence base, I come to you and I say, Susan, what do you want to eat? You know, it's your table. We actually call it the patient's table. It's your Susan, your, your table, Susan. You tell me what's, what's your favorite? Just forget it. Just something you want to enjoy. Maybe pizza, burger, taco, whatever. Do you have one? Oh, do I have one? Oh, yeah, I like yeah. It. Tell me. I like it. Okay, a favorite food. Okay, let's. Why not say it? Start with pizza. Okay, you're near and dear to my heart because every Friday, uh, when I am home, is Pizza Friday. So right, right now, my dough has been fermenting for two days. And so let's look at this. this. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> let's look at this from a culinary medicine perspective. So the traditional message is: don't eat pizza because it's horrible for you. And if you are talking about calling Grubhub or Uber Eats and getting a delivery from one of the mega chains, you are absolutely right. Just let's say we agree, never eat that stuff. It's ultra processed garbage. It's one of the worst things you could put in your mouth. However, I want you to come. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that was it. My I'm, looking last at, night. I'm, I'm looking at her, her homemade pizza. <laughs> um, now I'm going to take you, uh, you and I are going to go to Naples because I'm doing Napolitano tomorrow. So we've got uh, organic, uh, triple double zero flour. We've got water. We've got yeast. In my case, a little sourdough starter and a touch of salt. And we're going to let that ferment for at least 42. I'm doing 72 hours. And that's actually going to change the food matrix, which is going to affect how we access the nutrients, how we physiologically respond to that food. It's going to affect things like its glycemic index, et cetera. And to that, when it's done, I'm going to put a tomato sauce that's nothing but crushed tomatoes and a little salt. That's it. It's a serving of vegetables. Oh, and then more than a serving of vegetables. Sorry, I have to interject. Can we add some little fresh EVOO and basil and garlic? Oh, you get it. You're, you're jumping to the oh, head of the pizza class. Right. <laughs> my mouth's not. But yeah, you're exactly right. So, so the topping is a little uh, grass fed buffalo mozzarella. And as you said, a little extra virgin olive oil, real olive oil, and of course, a fresh basil for our margarita pizza. And, and that, um, when we look at it from a culinary medicine perspective, is what we call group three or minimally processed food. And that is the stuff that's really good for us. And not only good for us, but the vegetable fibers in there, the things from that, that crust, uh, from the vegetables that we put in, right? That's going to feed our gut microbiome in a very positive way where what's added to that industrial pizza turns out affects our gut microbiome in a negative way that accelerates our path to inflammation, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. So in culinary medicine, we can't look at a pizza because a pizza is not a pizza. 
since World War II, we've <laughs> fundamentally changed our food and food pathways. So we have to go back and change our perspective and the questions we ask when, when we sit down and say, well, what is it we want to eat? And so in culinary medicine, the question you have for me is, hey, Chef Dr. Mike, how do I eat a pizza? And then we sit down and we figure out how that can be done. Oh my gosh. I love, I, I hope everyone's mouth is watering. This is so much fun <laughs> cooking and teaching about cooking and teaching people how to really not just prepare these healthy meals, truly really enjoy every aspect of it is fun. Yes. It's fun, isn't it? And so you touched on so many things. I want to bring up two very specific things oh. bring it back to two of the things you mentioned. Number one, just to kind of summarize for listeners too, is types of calories really matter most. I always say in this podcast too, small, you know, the small daily habits matter most when it comes to food. Absolutely. The types of calories matter most. I had a client yesterday ask me, I was describing this because all of those overcooked and the way we cook also matters a lot, but back to the raw ingredients and <laughs> cooking from scratch. Now, not everybody loves to cook as you and I do. You, I think we both find it a stress relief. I love to, I do, um, you know, so that's one thing, but so types of calories matter most. And then you talked about the regenerative farming, the soil, like where the source yes. of your food and the gut microbiome, we cannot downplay that. Like that is also one of the most important aspects of what you're teaching. Absolutely. Um, so I actually wrote a book uh, some years ago called The Fallacy of the Calories. Right. Because, you know, and, and to give people an idea, because I have a degree in chemistry, so I'm sort of a chemistry nerd, food nerd as well. Most people think, you know, calorie equals uh, food energy, which it actually doesn't. So to give a perspective, uh, the calories developed with the onset of the Industrial Revolution as a uh, measure of heat. So one kilocalorie, as you know, as a dietitian, equals 4.2 kilojoules, which is actually the measure of energy. And the idea behind a calorie was to look at, and the definition of a calorie is one calorie raises one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure. It's, and what does that even mean to people? Yeah. Well, what does that have to, what does that have to do with food? Yeah. It has nothing because where it comes from is when something has more calories, it means that that I can put in less coal or carry less coal on a, a steam train and it, the steam train becomes a more efficient engine. And that's where calories come from. At that time, a lot of work was still being done in the 1860s by people, manual labor, by farm animals. And so the idea was if we can give them cheap fuel, i.e. something a lot of calories, then people can uh, get a lot of work done and it's cheap to feed them. And that's the whole idea behind calories. Um, and this was developed by Wilbur Atwater while he was over in Germany in the 1860s. He brought that back to what we still use today in the government, what's recognized as the Atwater caloric tables. But it has little to nothing to do with food and its impact. This, we've conflated over the years that the amount of calories translates into health. And, and the way we get a calorie, which we, we just kind of do it by math today, but the original way was like to take an apple, throw it in something called a bomb calorimeter, which burns it to ashes, and then measure how much heat, how, how hot the water got, and that's your caloric value of an apple. Well, you and I both know, unless you're like sore on the grape from Lord of the Rings, nobody metabolizes food that way, right? And it, it talks to nothing about the... The, the ways that we metabolize and the what we call coefficient of extraction, meaning how much of that energy do we use and nothing about vitamins and nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. So if we were to say, as many people do, and conflate calories with health and say less is better, the healthiest thing we could eat would be like zero calorie you know, beverages with artificial sweeteners. And something came out last week showing that when you when you drink them, you have a high risk of overall cancer uh, and specifically breast cancers. So clearly that is not the answer. So it is not. you are a hundred and fifty gazillion percent correct that a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie. Thank you. I, the way you said it was a lot more fun. <laughs> The bottom line is the same and and cheap fuel 
gets us to a bad, unhealthy place. So cheap fuel in the sense of what we call cheap and easy calories, right? The mm-hmm. the Krispy Kreme. Sorry, Krispy Kreme. They don't like me. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's that there are all these ultra processed foods, packaged foods, as yep. you, you quoted that, you know, from um, my from from Tufts, the study out of Tufts. And I had actually Dr. Bonnie Kaplan on recently talking about these, these ultra processed food and the percentage of our calories in both children and adults that come from them every day. So I'm not going to harp on how negative they are and that negative is that we're going to we're going to continue to talk about both yours and my real life experiences of eating eating foods in other countries and how we both lost weight. I want to, we, they're kind of anecdotal. This is, but this is going to tie into a much greater actual study. So I'm going to turn it over to you. You were in Japan. I was in Germany, but we were both about the same age, 17, 18 years yeah. old. And it's yeah. like, we were just living in these foreign countries and lost weight. I'm turning it over to you to explain what we can put. Yeah. So part of my background goes to uh, being involved in the martial arts And so I had the good fortune to have an extended uh, visit uh, over to Japan, which included uh, time in a a Buddhist monastery in the mountains of Japan, et cetera. But like you said, you know, I was a a growing, you know, young American used to American food and American sized portions. And to give you an idea of the time, I don't want to date myself exactly because I will go into clinical depression. But (laughs) suffice to say that I arrived. And I was there when the very first McDonald's opened in Tokyo, not far from the hotel where I was staying. And I remember walking out and seeing the line out and down the road and and almost reaching where our hotel was. And it's burned into my memory because I saw women in kimonos, you know, dressed traditionally. Mm -hmm. So many of them back then with the still the wooden geta or the wooden shoes, young people, no skin blemishes, very few wearing glasses. And as I continued to, you know, go back to over to Japan over the decades and started to see KFC on every corner, more McDonald's, Pizza Hut's, Shakey's, et cetera, and saw the change in their diets became more westernized because they loved everything American over there. And to see the change in, in the population that they now deal with obesity, the kids have glasses, you know, um, et cetera, uh, they, they have typical American acne issues. So a very interesting compare and contrast. But yeah, I was over there, you know, eating all the time. Uh, sat down, ate the meals, was snacking on things. But I was eating at that time, as you can imagine, it was really traditional Japanese food. As I said, Amer- McDonald's had just opened. There was one. So there wasn't all this fast food, ultra processed food anywhere to be had. It, you know, you would walk in and it was still when you would see a perfect apple. And each apple was in its individual netting because that was like a gift you brought somebody was a beautiful piece of fruit you would bring to their home as like a a gift. Like we would show up with a bottle of wine or something. They would bring this fruit that was absolutely perfect. And that's how valued, you know, the food and the food culture was over there. And in the time I was over there a little over a month, I I lost two pant sizes eating continuously (laughs) Because I was very active. Uh, Obviously, we were doing martial arts a lot, hiking, walking, doing martial arts every day. And also because it was just real delicious food. And and that's where really one of the loves of my cuisine, some of my favorites in terms of Asian flavors and particularly Japanese cuisine and Kaiseki cuisine, which is a tremendous influence in how I shop and cook and eat um, to this day, just in the seasonality and respect for ingredients, as you talked about you know, has has continued, you know, to, to impact me and, and impact me in a really joyful, delicious way. I, I must add that as well. Right. And that's the same for me. I, I probably don't talk about that enough. And those travel food experiences form us. They are probably some of the best and most wonderful memories, <laughs> you know, and really help us do what we're doing today because, bringing in those experiences and the knowledge and then that respect for cultures, flavors, food, ingredients. It's, it's just so important. So I love sharing that as much as you do, I can tell. And we could talk about this absolutely forever. And one thing I did want to ask you too, on that note, this is just kind of funny. What's cooking in your home today? Oh, so, so today um, I am making a uh, tomato and fennel 
pork Negroni risotto. So I tell, I got to tell this little funny story about risotto because, you know, people often ask me, they're like, Chef Dr. Mike, what's your one, one go-to dish? Like, what do you serve if you, if you got to serve something and you know you want it to be good? And for me, it's risotto. And, and it has to do with my one brush with fame in, in my entire life, which centered around food. And so uh, I was at the chef's table and at that time, Gordon Ramsay owned it. It was a two Michelin star restaurant uh, run by Marcus Waring in London called Petrus. Uh, it's since changed hands, but neither of those celebrity chefs was there. And in fact, when we asked the chefs who were cooking, they're like, we're not sure Gordon can actually really cook in the kitchen anymore. He's been on TV, you know, so long. <laughs> and and so, they, so we got to know him and the chefs were coming up and they're like, hey, you know, you seem to really know a lot about food. And I was like, you know, I know a little bit. Now, remember, these are Michelin star chefs, two Michelin stars. And I was like, listen, I know a little bit, not like you guys know it and, and fix it. And so one of the chefs, and I can't remember, was, there were two, Chef Tristan and Chef Andy. And, and they're like, oh, can you cook a risotto? And I was like, yeah, I, I cook risotto. You know, I think I make a decent risotto. They're like, great, come on in the kitchen. It's like, excuse me? And so lo and behold, I'm in this two-star Michelin kitchen cooking black truffle risotto for the pass. Mm. And and I must confess, I was like every, you know, newbie food shocked contestant on Hell's Kitchen that anyone has ever seen going like, what am I doing here? This is, this is a, you know, this is terrible. And they're like, and then I got yelled at. So I was like, how long on that black truffle risotto? It's like two minutes to the past chef. And, and, and it's like, 30 second chef, you know, and I bring it up, I put it down and I had a little, my station was kind of around a little corner. So I went back to my station to clean up my station. And then I kind of peek around the corner like this. And, and this chef is just staring at me, the, the executive chef on the past, because he like knew I would peek around the corner. And he just looked at me and, and didn't drop my, my gaze as he put it in his mouth, put the spoon down, put the bowl down, didn't stop looking at me. And then he goes, send it and i was like yes and, and i was like i quit i'm out of the kitchen you know i made uh black truffle risotto made the pass in the two-star michelin i'm out of here i'm officially retired so that is that's my little risotto story and and that's why uh you know I, i'm making a little bit tonight and and we're doing a new technique and it's actually a new recipe where i'm sous videing um some some heritage uh pork it's manzanilla pork uh, raised on a farm a few miles from my house, a heritage breed. Uh, I know how they're raised. I visited the farm. Uh, animals are well, well taken care of. It's a regenerative type agriculture situation, as you mentioned. And I put in some herbs and the flavors of a Negroni, which for those who don't know is a little bit of Campari, which is a, a bitter orange uh, Italian liqueur, a gin, English gin with a lot of herbal and juniper notes and a little bit of dry vermouth, uh, again, which brings a a complex herbal structure uh, to that. And we're going to let it sous vide and sear it off and then put it in with the risotto. It's a bouquet. It's like, I can smell it. I can it taste is. it. It's making me happy <laughs> even talking about it. And I, I hope that helps me. Food is meant to be, you know, love. It is, it's fun. It's um, flavor matters. And so all of us eat, I'd say number one, based on taste. I love hearing that. You know, back to asking, I'm sorry, when you sit down. And, and, and I, Yeah, I just want to say, you, you just nailed something so very important that we forget, Susan. Um, and, and that's the, the love component of it, because let, when you stop and you just think about it, and I think this is, I can speak for all us professional chefs, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're in that category. But, you know, when you feed somebody and, and you, you put that food out there, what more can you give? I mean, what, what an act of love that really is. And, and it's a shame that so much of the diet has become sort of this cold, um, ultra processed stuff that's based on convenience and, and not that, that joy of food and that shared food experience and, and sort of the love that, that goes into it. You know, just to give an idea of, of kind of where we reach with culinary medicine, one of the most fascinating things that kind of connects all these, a lot of these dots that we do in culinary medicine that you mentioned, you know, um, you know, back to regenerative agriculture and gut microbiome was something I learned, you know, first, you know, we bond with our mothers 
over food, whether it's breast or bottle, right? That's our food experience. And when we do that, both for mother and child, you know, it becomes an oxytocin based experience. And for those that don't know, oxytocin is the love hormone, right? And that's, that's why as, as rotten, and I was, I, I, you know, I was a horrible child. I'm just glad none of my kids are like one tenth the, the hellion and, and heathen that I was. But nonetheless, when I look back and I was like amazed, my mom loved me. I mean, you know, till her dying day, my mom always loved me. And, it, it, you know, that's oxytocin. That's the best definition of oxytocin, you know, that I can give. As opposed to ultra processed food, which stimulates our dopaminergic reward center, which operates um, long and short the same way opiates do. And, and we, we know as a society, we've done really good managing that. So enough said <laughs> there. Um, but when. It's not funny. When, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But when um, a mother breastfeeds a newborn, one third of what we call the human milk oligosaccharides, which is, you know, a very uh, prominent component of human breast milk, the, 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 the newborn, the infant can't digest. And so it's like, well, why is the mother feeding the newborn something that supplies no direct to the nutri nutrition to the newborn? Well, it turns out that that type of oligosaccharide selectively encourages the growth of a certain bacteria in the gut, uh, Bacterioides infantis. And then that bacteria starts turning on genes uh, for the newborn that have to do with immune system development. And if you just stop and think about that for a moment and how intricately that connects us to nature, where the food comes from, because all the things that we know and some unwanted things that can wind up in human breast milk that affects our infant, that affects us, at that age that will affect us for the rest of the, our life, such that the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology say, please breastfeed your kids as long as possible, because for reasons maybe like this, that protects them when they're 15, 60 year old from heart disease and as adults. So yeah, it's, it's an amazing interconnectedness. What you just said, I have to reiterate, I have so much to say. American College <laughs> of Cardiology recommends breastfeeding. How yes. fan, right? I hope everybody listening just like jaw dropped. <laughs> now, I want to, um, why is this so relevant? Because what you said, so many um, um, things about the your mom and my mom. So I, I'm just going to say that ah, that relationship, you and I both loved cooking with our mothers. And mm -hmm. we did. We were talking about that. And we learned cooking from our mothers back to that. I was a breastfed <laughs> baby. I, believe you were at this, you know, as we talk about this, I have four children myself. I know they're embarrassed if they ever listen to this and I nursed all of my children. And um, no, this is right. And to create the, the healthy immune system, you are setting the foundation for their health for later in life. And so then we grow up and we start to cook with our moms. That's exactly how I learned how to cook whole foods. And, and, you know, it's so interesting. The more people I meet, even when I was a a dietetic intern, my roommates, and if they're listening to this, they'll laugh and they'll attest to it that I was probably the only one in our group that actually cooked things from scratch. I remember one of my friends saying, I can't believe you can, you can bake a cake from scratch and you can cook this from scratch. And I was just shocked that it was the, you know, the opposite experience for them, but I'm going to thank my mom. You're probably thanking your mother as well for the love of cooking and a lot of, right, what we know and have learned and, and also for breastfeeding us because we're, <laughs> for staying healthy. And so I just threw a lot in there and it's just, it's to make those connections is so important because I think a lot of people don't think about it, you know, from what starts from when we're very little. And even if we're adults listening to this guaranteed, you have maybe a child or a grandchild or, you know, we, we can change so much of the future generations Simply starting with that, getting more um, babies breastfed, getting more young children eating fresh local ingredients. And so now I'm switching to, right, to children. This is like, there's so much to do for future generations that is tied back to food and food and love, right? <laughs> it, it is. And, you know, studies have shown, and this was particular, I think, exposed during the COVID crisis, yes. you know, when all of a sudden there were transportation shortages and people couldn't, one, everybody who ate out 90% of the time, they couldn't go eat out. Two, um, they couldn't get a lot of the things that they were used to getting in terms of instant meals and things 
because of supply shortages. And they they were exposed as like, I don't know how to cook. I, I can't do any of this. What do I do? So one, when you when you cook with your kid, you're giving them a survival skill, right? You know, something that's been, you know, part of humankind since as we talked, we first sat around the campfire and had Macedon burgers and ribs. The second thing is also, and, and again, these are all components of culinary medicine. Uh, what the studies have shown us is that even if it's just as little as one night a week where there can be a family interaction, cell phones go away, you sit at a table and you have human to human interaction um, around the food that kids who experience that make better, healthier food choices as adults. Uh, they tend to be healthier as a group and they, they tend to consume, you know, healthier diet. So, you know, all those things come into play. And, and by that way of saying, you know, when you do that and you spend that little bit of time, even even if oh, I know we're crazy busy and 24 seven nonstop, I get that. I've lived that life um, for most of my life, unfortunately, you know, as most doctors do what I say, not what I do. But if you can find that time, you know, with your children, boy, you're going to impact them for the rest of their lives. And as you and I said, as adults, my mom passed away many years ago, but that's a memory I treasure. It brings me joy. And then something that, that I want to transmit, you know, to my kids. So um, and that's important. And these things are important because you also touched on, man, Susan, you really nailed a lot of these things. We, it's, hey, we really didn't plan this, folks. Um, it just kind of comes up in conversation. <laughs> But, you know, you talked about when we traveled and the different cultures and as what we're seeing, because in culinary medicine, we're about sustainability for the individual in terms of the food and diet being delicious. You want to eat it in terms of the plan, as you mentioned, regenerative agriculture sustainability. So we're doing good for the world. But there's also an important cultural sustainability. Uh, uh, and by that, I mean, when you look at some of these uh, cultures and we think about foods, and the native foods are being replaced with drive through ultra processed foods that are homogenized from America to France to Asia to Africa. The traditional foods, these ethnic foods, we're losing them. And, and I think that would be a terrible and for my all my own selfish reasons. I think that would be just a terrible travesty, you know, to lose these delicious indigenous flavor profiles that are connected to people's and people's histories and, and their stories. And, and I think if we, if we become one drive through society, we lose the stories and we kind of lose our individual stories. And, and, you know, if all we have at the end of the day are our experiences and, and a lot of those are our stories. That's it. That's what life is about. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is, it's amazing. You and I, I know, can keep talking forever. So we'll say, you know, we will continue this conversation. For now, though, I do want to ask you a couple more questions. Okay, Chef Dr. Mike, this is fantastic. I do want to ask you, what are we going to tell listeners as an as a takeaway today from what is one actionable takeaway that you can share with our listeners today? Well, Susan, I think what I'd share is something that we've talked on throughout this great conversation. Thank you again for having me on, which is ultra processed foods. And they have a specific definition. It, it can get quite complex. But the simple takeaway is what I call keep it to five to stay alive. So if you're not sure something is ultra processed or not, flip over that box and look at the ingredient label. And all you have to do is count. You don't even have to read it. And if it has more than five ingredients, generally speaking, in the United States, there's a more than 85 percent chance that that food is ultra processed. Put it back on the shelf. Great example. If you're shopping for pasta, I always look for imported from Italy. I'll turn it over. It'll say like, you know, organic Durham semolina wheat, water, maybe salt. You know, and that's it. I turn over a box of a similar po pasta from the United States and there's 42 things in there. Enrich this mono sodium bloody blah, blah over there and you know and the list goes on and so there's a great example of you know two things you could pick up two boxes of pasta all you have to do is count to get to one that's minimally processed or less versus and avoid the one that's ultra processed so keep it to five to stay alive 
I love that. And I'm going to even add to that because fruits and vegetables have no nutrition facts label. Right? So very, Brilliant. Brilliant. Very I'm going to steal that from you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. Please do. Oh, this is so much fun. I have one final question for you, Chef Dr. Mike, that I ask of every single one of my guests, and that is, what is one thing you're grateful for today? Well, I'm, I'm grateful to be here with you, and I'm just grateful to be here, um, you know, on this planet, uh, you know, another day above the roses, so to speak, um, and, and we should never take that for granted. And, and, and that's just something, going back to my experience in the martial arts in, in Japan, Many people associate the samurai sort of a, almost like a death culture, but that they were obsessed with death. And, and it's really quite the opposite, as I learned it at a young age, because if you're all about sacrificing yourself and death, you don't spend your entire being preparing to beat somebody else in a life and death situation. And you, your objective is to stay alive. But what they did was they confronted the reality that every day this may be my last day because I could get in a battle or a duel and, and that's that. And so there was a deep, deep appreciation and reverence for life. And that's paralleled my experience um, in interventional cardiology, where when I come in at 2 a.m. in the morning, I may be what stands between somebody's life and somebody's death. And, and so that's a very sobering responsibility. You know, in the kitchen, I can start again. In a cath lab, you don't get that option. So you talked about the seriousness of the moment um, in there. And that really relates also to to the food and, and being you know grateful because whether you eat a plant, whether you eat an animal, whether you eat a mushroom that's a fungi, something on this planet gave its life for you. And, and we should be grateful and, and respect it. And, and I think that's one of the things I love about um, my chef friends when we sit around is there's just a, a real respect uh, for where the ingredients come from and and all the people that have sacrificed to get them to our table. And that can be lost in our modern society where we're about convenience and disconnected from everything. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we disconnect ourselves from death and push it in a corner and we disconnect ourselves from our food and we grab it out of a vending machine or pop it in a microwave. Um, there's more to life than, you know, Facebook likes and Instagram posts. Um, I know that's that shock or earth shattering uh, information, but you know, I'm just, I'm just really grateful for everything. Grateful to be here. And really, again, I'd like to say I'm th grateful for you for having me on and, and sharing. And um, Hey, I made a new friend today. So that's great. I wanted to say the same. I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity for meeting you today because we did just meet, even though I think we're actually twins separated at birth. Yeah. <laughs> My sister from another mister. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners are thinking, what is happening here today? So this has been so much fun. Thank you. This has been a great experience for me. And I just want to continue to inspire and empower our listeners. And I know you did that today. I want Thank to you. point out that you have the two upcoming books, The Ordinary Meal and Bite Me, Life Lessons from <laughs> Culinary Medicine. Love the titles <laughs> of all your books. So um, finally, where if you want listeners to, to seek you out, find you, connect with you, and uh, where would that be, Chef Dr. Mike? Uh, they can have her to www.chefdrmike, that's Chef Dr. Mike.com. You can follow us on social media. Drop me a line. I'm not famous, so I answer everything myself. And if I don't get to you right away, it usually means I was on call or something the day before. But I love communicating with everyone. And they can also find out we offer our online culinary medicine course that we teach at the university. It's available online. And people, if you complete it, you will get a level one certification in culinary medicine from the University of Montana. For medical folks out there, it's 36 level one, which are the highest CMEs. And for chef friends out there, you will get continuing education units uh, from the American Culinary Federation. So uh, drop on by the website and uh, leave, leave me a message or, or a recipe or a picture of your food. Fantastic. I love all of that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you again. And I hope to see you back here soon. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for taking the time to join me and listen to this episode. Listeners can find more information and also subscribe to the Sense of Wellness podcast at www.ccphp.net forward slash SENS forward slash podcast. 
That's www.ccphp.net forward slash sends forward slash podcast. This show is brought to you by Castle Connolly Private Health Partners. We are a concierge medicine organization that partners with exceptional physicians to deliver an unrivaled healthcare experience while also empowering our members to achieve their optimal well-being. Be sure to listen in next time to the Sense of Wellness podcast and remember, simple daily habits matter most. Mm-hmm.